several hours before UFC 190 kicked off, I had the bright idea to go to my computer and check uh, the web, the internet to see what time the pay-per-view actually started because it was being promoted as having seven fights in the main card. I thought that someone might come up with the intelligent idea to start the card a little bit earlier. Maybe half an hour earlier, an hour earlier, like they did. They did at one point a test run, but instead they kicked it off at ten o'clock, and it went till one thirty in the morning, my time anyway. And it was an absolute disaster and a huge mistake. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Prediction. As always, I am your host Scott Johnson, and on this episode of the show, we're bringing in the upcoming UFC Fight Night seventy three. There'll be six main card predictions, and I'll be giving you all of them in this episode. All of my preliminary picks will be available at KamikazeOverdrive.net along with the bet packs. I won. I think it was eighty four units. That's pretty sizable, especially uh, coming off the last card. I think I only had, I had another part of it was only one fighter off, uh, cashing a lot more. So, so it was it was a good overall night. I went nine and two at UFC 190. But as I was referring, Ronda Rousey retained her title, and the Shogun Nogueira fight was pretty entertaining. But between the earlier fights in the pay per view and the final two fights, we had two tough Brazil matchups that really, unfortunately, no one really gives a hoot about, and it really wrecked the pay per view. The people I was watching with were very upset. That they had to sit around and watch these two fights and wait till you know late late hours of the night for the fights they actually wanted to see. It just was a bad mistake. Put them start the pay per view off with them at the, the very least. Or the, start the pay per view early if possible. Put them on the prelims. Do something. But that was a mistake in the UFC. I can't believe they actually thought that was a good idea. Uh, you know, just a long list of issues they've had of late. As you probably can tell, I'm a little bit under the weather, so I apologize for my voice. And uh, on that note, let's get to my first prediction. We're going to kick things off in the UFC's flyweight division as the 14th ranked Ray, the Taz Mexican Devil Borg, 8-1-0, takes on the debuting Gene Herrera, I'm probably saying that wrong with Herrera, 8-0 undefeated. Now, as I said, Herrera's undefeated, he's also debuting, which is two, you know, interesting scenarios we've got there. Borg so far, he's 2-1 in the UFC, he could have been easily been 3-0, losing a very tough debut fight against a solid veteran in Dustin Ortiz. For Herrera, he's 1 inch taller, of a 2 inch reach advantage, but Borg is younger by about 3 years. Uh... Win, win total wise, Borg six wins by submission, one knockout, and he's one and one. Then when the fight goes the distance, Herrera one win by knockout, five submissions, and two decisions. So fairly similar records. So good matchmaking there, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, for Borg, four first round finishes. Uh, he did submit Chris Kalaitis in his last fight in the third round, and he has two second round finishes. So the guy can finish, and he can do it at any time in the in the fight. He's not one of these guys. It's first round or nothing. For Herrera, he stopped opponents six times in the first round. Uh, plus, he's, the other two fights have gone the distance that he's won. So he's he is a first round finisher, uh, BJ purple belt overall. For Borg, he has an excellent wrestling game. So far in the UFC, he's averaged 5.46 takedowns at a 73% completion rate. It's a very good number through three fights. He had five takedowns against Kalaitis and five takedowns against Dustin Ortiz, which is very solid. And against Shane Howell, he only scored one takedown, but that's all he needed to eventually set up the submission. He has an excellent transition game, exceptionally smooth when he's looking to uh, advance his position on the mat. Aggressive passing skills, uh, excellent back mount. Five of his wins have come by rear naked choke. Uh, 60% takedown defense. He was taken down twice by Dustin Ortiz, and it'll probably be tested here against Herrera, who will be looking to put him on the mat. Now, Borg is a decent striker. He will try high risk maneuvers because he is so confident in his ground skills if he does get taken down. Watch out for a jumping knee that he likes to mix in. For Herrera, his striking skills, pretty workable. Solid jab. He'll also throw a nice lead left hook. He could benefit from, you know, integrating his kicks a little bit more. Uh, but. He might not. It might not be a bad idea in this matchup not to kick if he wants to keep uh, Borg from getting a top position. He's a pretty good clinch fighter. Look from the dirty box, throw some elbows and knees in that position as well. Overall, he's a, the newcomer is a very solid athlete. He has two wins by rear naked choke and two by triangle. He has one unknown submission, so he's got a couple nice varieties in there that he can go to. He tends to chain his submissions together until something sticks, and he will attack with submissions. And if they don't come through, he will use that uh, distraction as a way to pan, uh, pass and advance his position when on the mat. He has you know decent takedowns, but for the most part, he tends to rely a little bit too much on his physical abilities and not technique when he's looking to take to score takedowns, and guys have a better chance of defending that. The biggest concern with the new guy is his takedown defense. He can be taken down. He can get stuck on his back. We've seen that happen before in some of his pre-UFC fights. Uh, in his last matchup against Josh Ravey, he taken down a couple times. Eventually, he was able to counter and get into position to win that matchup, but still didn't look good early on. And it's something against a, a guy, a grappler of the caliber of Ray Borg. You do not want to let him get on top of you or get in position to go to work with his submission skills. A couple things here. As I said, a debuting fighter, an undefeated fighter, and a fighter that's used to ending fights in the first round. Those are all tough scenarios to overcome when you're taking a big step up. Not always the best combination and combo, and you're facing t a top-level talent like Borg. If you can't get him out of there quickly, that's going to pose a lot of problems. Borg is really coming into his own. He's exceptionally dangerous on the mat. Most likely, will want to take the fight there. 
If he can't uh, score the early submission, I still think Borg wears him down in this top game and transition game, exhausts him on the mat, and gets something later like he did against Chris Kalaitis. Either way, my prediction is Ray Borg to defeat Gene Herrera by submission. In the middleweight division, Chris Camozzi, 21-10-0, battles Tom Kong Watson, 17-8-0, in what could arguably be a fighter leaves town, or the loser leaves town, in this matchup. Camozzi overall has lost five straight USC bouts, and this is his third run with the company. He got back in on short notice in his last matchup because he was the only one who wanted to take uh, the Jacare fight. I think it was less than a week's notice. He'd already fought Jacare once, and... The result was pretty much the same. He's been submitted in both matchups. The second time he fought him, it took Jacques Ray a minute and four less to put him away than it did their first uh, encounter. For Watson, he's fought six times in the UFC so far. He's two and four in the inside the octagon. He does have a surprising win over the streaking Sam Alvey, who's also on this card. We'll talk about momentarily. But he's coming up a very subpar fight against Hafe on the towel. Physically, Kamozi one inch taller, three inch reach advantage, and he's four years younger. Uh, overall, Kamozi six wins by knockout. He's never been knocked out, so he's pretty durable that way. He is seven and five in fights and by submission. Probably something you're not going to have to worry about with Tom Watson. And he's eight and five when going the distance. For Watson, equally as impressive, eight and zero oh in fights ending by knockout. Excellent chin. He's one and two in fights ending by submission, and eight and six when going the distance. It would appear that both guys, based on their you know almost 500 decision records, it would appear that both of them have trouble doing enough to differentiate themselves from their opponent in the eyes of the judges to convince them that they should be given the decision win. Uh, both guys actually have recent fights against Hafe on the towel. Natal, Kamozi lost a controversial bout to Natal that ultimately got him cut for the second time in the UFC. A lot of people felt, including myself, felt he had won it. Watson, it was a more clear-cut victory for uh, the Brazilian. He really put a beating on Kong for the majority of that matchup. Uh, Tom Watson, Muay Thai striker, brings a lot of pressure. Uh, when he fought Natal, though, he was coming up short with his kicks, and a lot of people pointed to a hurt foot. I also felt that the fear of being taken down probably meant he wasn't willing to sit down and connect uh, and really commit to his punches. Uh, whenever he moved forward, though, he was getting tagged in that matchup. He did seem to get stronger in the second half, but the damage was already done. He was already behind on the scorecards and wasn't going to pull it out without a knockout. Uh, one of his more his better performances when he fought uh, Stanislav Nedkov, he had a lot of success in the clinch exhausted him, did a lot of damage in the clinch, beat him up in there, and really had a lot of success there. And I think, you know, we could see him try and utilize something here against the bigger Kamozi. Uh, for Kamozi, he throws a nice long jab, has some hard leg kicks, which I really like. He's exceptionally durable, so is Watson, uh, but Kamozi, a very big grinding style, and, you know, those are his biggest weapons, his durability and his grinding style, his ability just to wear on guys when he's fighting lower-level opponents. It's difficult for them to get past the fact this guy's not going away. And he's had a couple close fights against uh, Bruno Santos, I believe was one of them, where basically he did the, he got the better of the fight, he just kept getting taken down. But it showed his durability and ability to outlast his opponent for the most part. I thought he got the nod over Natal in a similar f uh, fashion. Strikes landed per minute are very close, but Kamozi gets hit almost 1.5 strikes less per minute. And that should show up with the judges if he can limit the damage. Watson seems... Uh, you know, way too willing to take a shot, and that's not something you want to do in a fight that's going to go the distance if you're not going to land some big-time impactful strikes. He did seem much more aggressive against Sam Alvey because he knew he wasn't going to get taken down. He seemed much more committed to his strikes, and that could be a, a situation we see here. But I think Kamozi's size and reach is going to help him out. He needs to use movement to defuse the constant forward pressure of Watson. But again, I said Tom Watson gets hit too much. Don't be shocked if you don't see Kamozi go for a level change to look for a taken at some point in time. I think this could be a very close fight. Don't be surprised if it's a split decision. And I think Kamozi is going to get the nod in it. So my prediction is Chris Kamozi to defeat Tom Watson by decision. Heavyweights collide in the next bout as Jared the Big Show Rochelle, 12 2 0, battles. The man with the mustache, Timothy Johnson, with a current record of nine wins and one loss. Now, Rochal is coming off a nice rebound stoppage of Josh Copeland. He had a seven-fight winning streak and uh, snapped in the fight prior by Alexi Olenek, uh, who knocked him out. For Johnson, he had a debut knockout over Shamil Abder came off. I'm going to butcher that name, probably. He's coming with eight wins in a row. He also scored knockouts of uh, Travis View and Kevin Asplund, so it's certainly a nice little record uh, for him to build on. Rochal, four wins by knockout, uh... Two losses by night. That's where his two big losses have come. He's 3-0 in fights and in submission. 5-0 when he goes the distance. For Johnson, five wins by knockout. Four submission losses. And he has one loss by submission. He has never gone the distance. Physically, Johnson, one inch taller. Two inch, two inch reach advantage. And their weight will be roughly in the same uh, area. Uh, both guys actually come from collegiate wrestling backgrounds. Rochelle, NCAA Division I wrestler. Johnson wrestled at NCAA Division II school. Uh... 
What Timothy Johnson likes to do, he likes to brawl in close, work in the clinch, throws a lot of knees to the legs and body of his opponent, tries to break them down. His top game is, is pretty strong, uh, but his shot, his, his takedowns are average. He has trouble if he can't score the initial takedown once a contact is made. He tends to get stuck in the clinch, and that can be it can be draining, it can wear opponent, um, opponent down, especially if he can do damage. But if he's looking at it to the ground, he's not that good at it after he, he, if he can't bowl his opponent over with his first shot. In his last fight, he did show an exceptional level change. Took his opponent down and moved immediately to a to mount position and got a, had a lot of success. Unloaded with strikes and the referee. I thought it was a little bit of a quick stoppage, but the referee ultimately jumped in and and, and called the fight off with a couple seconds left in the round. Uh, he does like to try and punch his way into the clinch with big looping punches. And in his last fight, he was getting tagged because he just kept coming, attacking in straight forward, straight lines. He was and it was pretty predictable. And his opponent saw him coming, was able to hit him with a lot of shots. He is willing to give a shot to take a shot. Or take a shot to give a shot, my apologies. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you're getting hit too much, especially in the heavyweight division, that will catch up with you. For with Rochalt, he's a top-level wrestler too, but his takedown numbers have not been that impressive either. He's had a lot of trouble taking guys down. Uh, again, he likes to shoot in, and he tends to get stuck in the clinch as well. Averages this 1.71 takedowns at a 41% completion rate. Against Josh Copeland in his last matchup, once he eventually got Copeland on the mat, he absolutely mauled him. We saw him lock up that gift wrap. He actually pinned the other arm with the knee and was dropping some big shots. Eventually got the TKO finish from that position. He's very much a grinder. He will work in the clinch as well. As I said, he's 5-0 in fights that go the distance. And if fights that go outside of the first round with him, he's 7-1. So that's a pretty impressive record that basically says he's able to win that war of attrition and break his opponents down. For Johnson, though, in a comparative fashion, he's seven, he has 7 wins inside the first round. He's only been outside the first round 3 times in which he's won two of those three fights and he's never going to be on the three-minute mark in the second round so it really tells you if he can't finish Rochelle early there could be some issues in the second half of a matchup. We have seen Rochelle have a lot of success against uh, uh, Soa uh, Palale, Copeland, and uh, Walt Harris as well where it was you know a little bit closer early on and as the fight progressed he just simply pulled away from his opponent. Uh, he has been knocked out twice, which is a little bit concerning. He was hurt by Copeland as well. He seems a little bit more cautious at times, but then when he opens up, he can get a little bit wild, and he tends he can do damage with the striking, but he can also get hit. For my money, Johnson is just a little bit too hittable. He comes forward too predictably, and I think Rochelle is a slightly better striker. This fight could spend a lot of time in an ugly, grinding clinch with both guys struggling to score takedowns, especially in the first half. In that scenario, I prefer the guy with the history of winning fights outside of the first round over the guy known for winning fights inside the first round. Rochelle, he could get himself knocked out, and that's probably the way Timothy Johnson wins this matchup. But look for him to grind Johnson down after a close opening round. Uh, spent a lot of time spent in the clinch. I think Rochelle eventually gets the better of him, puts the wrestler on the puts his counterpart wrestler on the mat in a position he's not comfortable with. And my prediction is Jarrett Rochelle to defeat Timothy Johnson by decision. Bear with me, folks. I'm listening to myself talk through the microphone, and I can barely stand it. My voice sounds so nasally and annoying. Uh, next up, we're in the middleweight division. Number 15th ranked, Derek Brunson, strike force veteran, uh, with a current record of 13 wins and 3 losses, takes on smiling Sam Alvey with a big-time record of 25 wins, 6 losses, and 1 no contest. Now, both guys are streaking in the middleweight division. Brunson's won 2 in a row in 4 of his last 5. He's only lost in that span coming against Yoel Romero, a fight that he was winning until he got stopped late, partially because he got gassed out and partially because Yoel Romero went beast mode on him. Uh, for Al Alvi, he debuted with a loss to the aforementioned Tom Watson, but he has won three consecutive fights, all by first-round stoppage since that matchup. Physically, Brunson will have a two-inch reach advantage. He's also one inch taller. He's also two years younger. He's a former NCAA Division II wrestler. And for Alvi, his accreditation big one, BJJ Blue Belt, even though it's not really his MO to use that. For Brunson, five wins by knockout. He does have two losses by this method as well, which perks ears up when you're talking Sam Alvi as an opponent. Uh, his losses came against Yoel Romero, which is a TKO stoppage on the ground, and Jacques Sousa back in strike force. 4-0 in fights ended by submission, 4-1 when they go the distance. For Sam Alvey, of his 26 wins, 17 have come by knockout, so you know what he is looking for in this matchup. Uh, he's 2-1 when submissions are involved, 7-5 by decision, so you know his primary method of winning fights is knocking guys out, and he's done a great job of that in his last three matchups. Uh, based on those numbers, it's a pretty straightforward game plan. Alvey wants to keep this fight standing, and Brunson, for the most part, should want the fight on the ground. Now, Derek Brunson, he could strike with Sam Alvey. There's certainly opportunities for to do that. Uh, and he could hold his own, but that still leaves him open to what Sam Alvey does best. And for the most part, I don't think Alvey, even though he trains with a team quest and he's shown flashes of being able to work on the ground, I don't think he can wrestle with Derek Brunson. He certainly does not want to spend any time on the mat with him. Uh, for Alvey, he has absolute dynamite in his hands. If he touches his opponent, they are in some serious trouble. He couldn't knock out Tom Watson, but he hurt him a couple times in that matchup. Uh... 
The Dan Kelly fight was not a shocking knockout victory, even though Kelly had never been knocked out before. But keep in mind here, the other two guys he's knocked out, Dylan Andrews and Cesar Fajeda, they have a combined seven losses by knockout. So yes, he absolutely blew their faces up when he hit them, but at the same time, you know, there are issues there that's certainly not something new to those guys. When he fought Andrews, he was taken down a couple times in that matchup, especially right off the bat, and he had a lot of issues before he eventually got that really odd KO, or I think he clipped him on the way down with an elbow, potentially inadvertent, and then moved him out and knocked him out. Uh, against Fajeda, he was getting absolutely outworked on the feet, and Fajeda was landing a lot of strikes. It was kind of one of those ones where it looked like he was just waiting for his opportunity to pounce and landed a counter left and shut the lights off, literally. Fajeda just crumpled, and it was kind of... I think he only landed four strikes overall in that matchup, so... Uh, and actually, totally, in his three UFC wins, he's landed a total of 18 strikes. So that shows how effective he is, but at the same time, those numbers don't exactly translate well over three rounds. If you're not putting enough strikes on an opponent, if you can't knock them out, that's probably why he's 7-5 and five in decisions. He stands, you know, a little bit upright for my liking. Doesn't throw a ton of kicks. His boxing is serviceable, but there are certainly some holes there. But again, he has that one-hitter quitter power, which can turn a fight on its head in a moment's notice. For Brunson, he does have some defensive striking issues. He's t you tighten him up a little bit. It cost him back in his fight against Jacare Souza. As uh, I said, the Romero knockout came on the ground. But his striking game overall is improving. He knocked out Ed Herman. He dropped Brian Houston with a head kick before scoring the submission. Uh, but his bread and butter is his wrestling game. 3.97 takedowns at a 41% completion rate. He scored four takedowns in a decision win over Lorenz Larkin. And Yoel Romero, the former Olympic wrestler, took him down three times and was getting the better of the ground uh, fighting for the most part in the first two rounds. Uh, when he fought Larkin, he punched and tied up. I punched into, and worked his way into the clinch, tied up with Larkin, and then, you know, kind of ground him into the cage, kind of wore him out a little bit. He, he likes to establish that body lock and really muscles the opponent around, put him in a position they're not comfortable with, and eventually change levels for a takedown. He actually offers a nice variety of takedown uh, techniques. Uh, shoot him for the single and turn in the corner. He will come in low and looking, you know, to avoid getting countered. He also has some good trip takedowns, which I fully expect to see him using in this matchup. He has a strong top base, very tight control, no space, and he stays active to avoid getting stood up. He did slow down in the Romero fight, but we have seen him have success in longer matchups. Alvi has that type of power that, you know, he can knock anyone out, but he doesn't throw the ton of volume, and his defensive wrestling is a major question mark, and I don't like him if he's forced to fight off his back, which I fully anticipate being the case here. Brunson needs to be careful closing the distance. I think as the fight progresses, Alvi's still dangerous, but I think Brunson will have more and more success putting him on the mat. I think he grinds him into the cage, grinds him on the mat, drops some ground and pound, and my prediction is Derek Brunson to defeat Sam Alvi by decision. Co-main event time, and we're in the UFC's lightweight division, and it is a big one. It's the number five ranked Michael the Menace Johnson, 17-8-0. Battles number 12th ranked Benil Dariush, 11 wins and one loss. Winner of this takes a massive step towards the title shot. Now, keep in mind, the current champion, Rafael Dos Anjos and Dariush, are training partners, which means, you know, that's iron versus iron. Two of the top guys training together is massive at King's MMA, but the same thing Dariush has already said he might have to go up to welterweight to compete because he's not going to fight his training partner. Both men have had a nice escalation of competition. Look at, look at Michael Johnson in his current streak. You know, beating Joe Lozon and Gleison Tebow and Melvin Gillard, all solid veteran fighters, and then picking up a big win over Edson Barboza in his last matchup to really establish himself. For Dariush, starting a little bit lower down on the talent scale, uh, Tony Martin and... Uh, Diego Fajeda, two guys he's defeated, then picked it up a little bit with Darren Cruikshank, and then beating uh, Jim Miller, I think that fight was on short notice, was pretty darn impressive overall. But also keep in mind, both these guys have had recent losses against unexpected competition. Dariush got knocked out by Ramsey Nijem. Let that sink in for a moment. Knocked out by Ramsey Nijem. Uh, the only loss of his career. And Michael Johnson lost to Reza Madadi not too long ago and actually was beat by Miles Jury as well. But Jury's a pretty solid wrestler and fighter in his own in his own rate. Uh, both guys 5'10", 1-inch reach advantage for MJ, Dariush 3 years younger. Uh, for Johnson, he comes from a collegiate wrestling background. He was an Ultimate Fighter finalist. 7 wins by knockout, 7-2 and two when going to the decision. And the big scary number that stands out here, when fights are ended by submission, he has 2 wins and 6 losses. He has made massive strides as a striker, but that big glaring defensive issues on the mat still appear to be, you know, an area of vulnerability and that Darius is going to look to capitalize on because he's a BJJ black belt and exceptionally talented grappler. He also is a Muay Thai black belt under Rafael Cordero, and people are talking about what he's done with Dos Anjos and done with Darius and really bringing fighters along, I believe, as uh, Fabricio Verdum as well. You can see that camp has really come a long way, and I expect to see strides out of Darius in this fight. He has... Uh, Coming in, he is 2-1 in fights ending by knockout. He has six submissions overall and three decisions. 
For Johnson, he wants to keep his fight standing. That's pretty plain and simple. 3.38 strikes landed per minute, 2.55 strikes absorbed. His high water mark landed 116 against Joe Lozon, who he absolutely boxed up in that fight. You look at some of the things he's done, though. He's knocked out Gleison Tebow and Danny Castillo, so that's impressive right there. He beat Edson Barboza, Tony Ferguson, and Melvin Gillard in striking-based fights. Those are three very good and very dangerous strikers, and he beat them all. So that shows you how good... Uh, Johnson is in, in training with the Black Zillions, how far he has come. He gets ex excellent extension on his punches, good combinations, carries a fantastic pace, excellent footwork, always working around the cage. He cuts off that cage exceptionally well, did that against Barboza, really kept the pressure on, and that really took away a lot of his kicking game. And he has some pretty good hard leg kicks as well, especially to the inside leg. Uh, he has he would benefit a little bit from incorporating some wrestling more. He started laying a few takedowns in his last couple of bouts. 78% takedown defense, but again, he has had issues with getting stuck on his back. And of course, those six losses by submission are glaring on his record. Uh, against Miles Jury, at taking down four times. Against Reza Madadi, at taking down three times. And as I said, the submissions are concerning. For Dariush, he's going to look to capitalize on that issue. He has an absolute smothering top game. Uh, once on top... Fighters are hard pressed for him to get get him off of them. Eight takedowns over his last four fights. He dominated Jim Miller on the ground. Good transition game. Uh, four of his six wins have come by submission. Uh, he also likes to throw that arm triangle up. He just keeps working guys over and looking for holds and just really wears them out. When he fought Miller, he mounted him, took his back a couple of times, attempted arm triangles, attempted rear naked chokes, and Miller's a crafty guy in the ground, and he got the absolute better of him. And again, he took that fight on short notice. Striking-wise, Dariush, he certainly doesn't look to be an imposing fighter, but he's getting... He's becoming much more dangerous. He has a very strong kicking game, hard inside leg kick, but his really his good his big power move is that left leg kick to the body. We saw him blast Darren Crookshank with that a couple of times. He will throw a nice one too, and he has a nice long jab that he will try and spear opponents with as they come forward. As long as this fight keeps standing, Michael Johnson is in his area of strength. But the question is, how aggressive will he be for fear of getting taken down? He might start off very strong, but if Darius takes him down and dominates him on the mat for a round, that really might take a lot of uh, the pep out of his step. Both guys are southpaws, which I think will create openings for Darius to throw that power kick to the body. Johnson, the last four opponents he's faced have gone 0 for 9 in takedowns, but they're not on Darius's level. I think Johnson, if he keeps it standing, he wins this matchup. I don't think he's going to be able to. I like the more multifaceted fighter in here. Darius could very well do damage with the striking, but I think he drags it to the mat, and my prediction is Benil Dariush to defeat Michael Johnson by submission. In the main event of the evening, it's the UFC's light heavyweight fighters on display as the former title challenger, number 4th ranked Glover Teixeira, 22-4-0, battles the number 6th ranked Ovince St. Preux, with a current record of 18 wins and 6 losses. Now, OSP, he fights out of Tennessee. That's where he trains. That's where he went to school. He will have the crowd in his corner, and they will be excited. He will ride that momentum into the cage. If he wins this matchup, that's three in a row. It's a big fight over a big opponent. He could very well be lined up for a title eliminator, or, you know, potentially he could be in consideration for a title shot with the division being so thin. I can't see him hopping over Ryan Bader or even Rashad Evans, but certainly he's there on the cusp. For Glover, he's lost two fights in a row to John Jones for the title and Phil Davis in his follow-up fight. He needs a win here, or his post-title fight descent is going to be significant. He will probably, I know he won't drop out of the top 10, but he'll slide down significantly three or four spots if he loses this matchup. Uh, both guys have a recent common opponent, Ryan Bader. Glover knocked him out in the first round. OSP lost a pretty one-sided five-round decision. But it's only, it's only lost in eight fights. Physically, OSP one inch taller will have a four inch reach advantage. He's also four years younger. Uh, St. Preux, nine and one in fights ended by knockout, five submission wins, but he's four and five when going the distance. So that seems to be an area of vulnerability. He's a BJJ blue belt, and he has comes from an absolute athletic background. For Glover, 13 wins by knockout. He's been knocked out just once. Six wins by submission, but a 500 record on, uh, on the judges' scorecards at three and three, and he's a BJJ black belt. For OSP, he's finished five straight opponents, three wins by knockout, or sorry, five straight wins. He's finished them all. Three wins by knockout, two by submission. His overall skill set is starting to catch up to his athletic uh, abilities, which is kind of scary and kind of dangerous. He throws some very hard leg kicks, gets exceptional extension on his strikes. When he fought Shogun, he caught him with a nice counter, did the same thing, a counter uppercut against uh, Patrick Cummins, who was coming and looking for a takedown, knocking them both out in the first round. 2.63 strikes landed per minute. Limits his opponents to just 1.73 strikes absorbed, so that's pretty. Uh, those are pretty good numbers. If he gets the strikes uh, landed per minute up, he'll really start to win uh, pull away overall with the judges. Uh, 1.7 takedowns at 60%. His his ground game is decent. His submission game, though, is getting much better. The Von Flu choke against Nikita Krylov. He broke Ryan Jimmo's arm with the Kimura, which we just saw dumbass Husamar Paul Harris do. 
uh, and that controversy there. Some of the negatives. He tends to leave his chin up when he's under attack, which is certainly a concern. Also, his cardio is a bit concerning as well because it seems to fail him. His endurance drops off as the fight goes. Uh, he lost decisions to Ryan Bader and Gegard Mousasi, and you could tell in both those fights he was worn out. You know, not not early, but certainly before the bell was even close to calling to the end of those matchups. Against Gian Vellante, he was slowing down in the third round before the eye poke, sent it to an early decision. His last eight wins have become before the final bell, so that tells you that he really thrives when he can finish his opponent early. For Glover Teixeira, big knockout power. He relies heavily on his boxing game, which is very strong. He attacks in flurries, 4.15 strikes land per minute. So that gives him a significant edge if he can get those type of numbers off in comparison to what OSP is used to. But he does get hit at a high, much higher rate, 3.67. So he needs to tighten up his defense a little bit. But those numbers could also be inflated, and they most likely are inflated by his fight with John Jones. Uh, and Phil Davis, of course, doesn't help either when he's on top of you like a big gorilla wailing away. Uh, he does close the distance very well, keeps pressure on, good head movement, gets in there and lands with power. He did lose the clinch battle with John Jones, but obviously Jones is the cha well former champion. Uh, couldn't get his shots off like he normally wants. Still an area of strength, still an area I expect to see him have success against Ovin St. Preux with. He has a decent wrestling game, which kind of goes under undervalued and people forget about. Uh, coming off those losses to Phil, uh, especially to Phil Davis, where he got dominated on the mat. They're simply better wrestlers, but the share of his wrestling is nothing to sneeze about. 2.32 takedowns at 50%. He took Bader down. He took Rampage Jackson down five times. He absolutely destroyed Fabio Maldonado on the mat, which Fabio doesn't have the greatest counter wrestling. Nonetheless, he still knows how to get it done. Heavy ground and pound, strong submission game. OSP has had major issues with ta his takedown defense. Taken down nine times by Ryan Bader and lost the fight primarily there, and that will really tax his gas tank if that is the case here. OSP has power, but I still think there are some holes in his striking defense. If he can finish Glover, you know, that's huge. That's a big win for him, but I see him slowing down in this matchup if he can't. As the fight progresses, round three, four, and five will be very difficult for him. Glover will have success with his wrestling, which will catch some people off guard. Takedowns, ground and pound, and he beats OSP in pretty much all areas. The better technical striker, more power. And despite the fact he's looked, you know, poor in his last fight and got beaten in the fight before by the champion, I still think he's a top fighter. And my prediction is Glover Teixeira to defeat Ovin St. Peru. I'm going to take Glover by knockout. So those are my six main card predictions for UFC Fight Night 73. I'll keep this short because I'm tired of listening to my own voice. I'm sure you are as well. I just want to touch upon the Husamar Paul Harris victory at World Series of Fighting. He cranked the Kimura on Jake Shields for far too long, even after Shields tapped, even after the official tried to pull him off. The guy's an absolute jackass. He needs to be decommissioned, not allowed to fight. No one should give him a license to get inside the cage in North America. Send him back to Brazil or wherever he wants to go to fight where they'll, commission, where they'll allow him to fight there. But that's disrespectful to the sport, disrespectful to the opponent, disrespectful for the the championship belt world series of fighting and it's embarrassing the uh suspension or whatever his punishment is supposed to come down tomorrow and i really hope they hammer the shit out of him potentially take his you know no no money no nothing he deserves it uh everything is coming to him uh as always thank you guys for listening make sure you click on the link or click on the subscription button as well if you haven't already done that and head over to kamikazeoverdrive.net for all of your predictions needs and uh ufc fight night 74 is coming up next so we will check that out as well take care guys